long, long time ago when we were organizing puppet camps, there was one guy who always showed up. And it's that guy, right? Which one? <laughs> Somebody earlier. Yeah, there, 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 there's a couple, but you were actually the one who always showed up when we did it. Um, we catch you sleeping in weird places. Um, this year, not yet, but that's because the hard work still starts, right? So I give the floor to Luke. For the next phase. Thank you. Look. Technically, I didn't actually fall asleep that time. Uh, so the, I think it was the puppet camp that we held here ages ago, not in this building. Uh, we held it in some place. Uh, yep, so whatever he just said. And uh, they had a room to have the event. And then there were literally no other horizontal surfaces that weren't hallway or bathroom floors. And uh, it turns out that after I give talks, I like, physically crash. I become exhausted. And there was literally nowhere to lay other than the cobblestones outside or under the stairwell. So I spent like 30 minutes physically exhausted after my talk under the stairwell. And uh, eh, you know, welcome to Belgium. <laughs> so this is an event, I think, for the believers. My guess is there's no one here who needs to be convinced about what we're here to talk about, right? You're not here to learn about why would I do configuration management or uh, you know, what should I do. In fact, my guess is that everyone here has already joined probably one-ish of the tribes that Mark was talking about. There might be people here who are in multiple tribes and just try not to let anybody in your respective tribes see you wearing the wrong gang colors on the wrong day or whatever. This is really about the high priesthood, the people who already know the answers, who already are out there telling the story. And we both come to share that reality, but also to get recharged, right? To, to help the people, who are, who, the other people who are here, and to uh, have them help us go back out and tell the story even more. Except, I think we're kind of on the wrong path. I think this, this event is fun, it's cathartic, and I think in a lot of ways it's important. But one of the things that I always sold Puppet as was a way to get rid of the, the high priesthood, or the way to get rid of those people in the ivory tower who knew everything. It was a way to democratize access to not just the information you needed to build and manage your infrastructure, but the actual tooling and the knowledge and all of the, the arcana that you need to build and manage complex infrastructure to get it out of the heads of a couple of people and make it accessible to everybody. And I think, this event is, has been important, but in some ways pushes us more towards that ivory tower that we've been trying to get rid of it for so long, and less towards the things the world actually cares about. And as a result, I think a lot of the work that's actually really important is not really getting done, is not really getting worked on, because we're enabled and allowed to spend all of our time working on these things that, that we care a lot about, and it feels fun, and it's super awesome, it's just not that important. In a lot of ways, the work that we're here to do, it's kind of done, right? We, we, we did so much of it. And one of the reasons this event feels weird for me is that I'm not sure that we as a group, we as a community, either knows quite what's next or are willing to admit that there needs to be a next or really quite realize how different, if at all, maybe the next looks exactly like the last 10 years. It, pretty unlikely, but it, you know, it's, it's conceivable. Or maybe we just haven't, you know, we all see it, but we haven't quite been willing to take up that next burden. And so I think, you know, Chris talked a lot about cross-community differences or cross-community collaboration and, you know, other words. Um, but I think for me, it's important that we find a way to look past not just what is different about our communities, but look past any differences in the communities themselves or the fact that there are differences and focus on the rest of the world, the world that, doesn't, that still doesn't know who we are, still doesn't know what we are, and figure out what they need, which I apparently spelled Ned in this note. Because I think that there is a new path. I think there is uh, a way out from here that is super awesome and is really interesting and can be fun. Um, but we've got to go on to new fights. We've got to go on to new things, to, to new areas. In my opinion, by any measure that I had when I started this thing, we've won. 
We did way more than I ever thought we would do. And you know, when I was writing this talk, I kept writing about a decade ago because you know, I, I started Puppet, uh, I guess it's almost 13 years ago now, but you know, I think about it as 12 because I can't do math. Um, so you know, it's like a decade-ish. Uh, but you know, Mark's been doing this for 25 years, and uh, I, the first automation tool I wrote was in 2000 or so. So you know, it's, like, it's been a while. But if you'd asked me at any point in the, the noughties, what's the most you could possibly hope to accomplish? We've done way more than that. And whether that we is me, or the people at Puppet, or the people in the community, or you know, anyone anywhere in the market, or you know, how much it's changed the world, the fact is much, much more has happened than I had any right to hope for in the early days. And when I think about how bad the state of being a sysadmin was in the year 2000 or the year 2005, I'm really, really happy that we're really, really far from that. But at the same time, I feel like we lost because the goal wasn't to build cool stuff. The goal wasn't, you know, and to be fair, we, we did, you know, every time you accomplish a goal, you kind of have to look up and say, what more can we do? What else can we do? But the goal wasn't to do something cool. The goal wasn't to make a small change. The goal was to build something that everyone could use. The goal was to change how everyone works. And I think one of the most pernicious aspects of this kind of event. And not just, it's not just this kind of, it's not just config management camp, it's any event you go to where the majority of the people at the event already know why they're at, they already know what you do and why you do it. And you know, Mark talked about going to Amazon and having the person he's talking to not know what CF Engine is. And these days, it's hard for us to find people who don't know what we do and don't know why we do it. But it's not because those people aren't out there, it's just because we don't talk to them, right? They don't come to our parties. They don't know that they need to be at these parties. And if they all came to this party, let's be clear, this would be a 100,000 person event. But the fact that it's not a 100,000 person event tells you that not enough people are at this event, right? Not enough people know about what we're doing. One of my least favorite questions that I get asked from you know, analysts especially is, you know, what are a couple of companies that are really, really great examples of what you're talking about, that just do this really, really well. And of course, all of us can name like two or three, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I don't want to talk about Netflix, and I don't want to talk about Google, I want to talk about you know, somebody else. And the problem is that there are a lot of people who are doing really interesting work, but there are very few that are really doing it pervasively. And if you look at most organizations, sure, there's, there's a pocket here and there. There's somebody over in that organization who's just doing awesome, awesome stuff. And then there's that company that's only got 18 people and they're doing amazing, amazing things. They also have no customers and so it doesn't actually matter. But, <laughs> but it's only really here or there. And across the whole market, it's still really, really bad. I was talking to somebody yesterday. He said he worked at a company that had 3,000 sysadmins managing you know, hundreds of thousands of servers, 100% manually maintained. Right? And all of us are like, no, they can't still exist. There's only got to be one. No, there's a ton of those. Right? There's a ton of those. There's so many of those that it's still actually, to a first approximation, it's just everybody. And the fact that we can sit in this room and tell ourselves, you know, we're across that line. Everybody already knows. Everybody doesn't already know. Right? We are in our own little ivory tower arguing about the differences between these small products that no one's using. Where did we go wrong? Right? What happened? Why are we here 10, 20, 25 years later with so little change? And it's important to note that this isn't about me, right? This isn't about Puppet. This isn't about any one product, any one individual. I mean, some of you are really wrong, but in general, <laughs> it's not about the specifics. Right? It's about going outside entirely and saying, what do they need? Why do they not hear? Why, do they, why does my proselytizing not catch them? Why does my story not convert them? Why do they not care about what I care about? And I think it's important to understand that I was right. My idea is the things that I built in Puppet, they were the right things. They were the right strategies. Oh, actually, maybe it was Mark. Maybe Mark was right. All of his ideas. I mean. He was more innovative, right? I had Mark's work to stand on. I had Steve Trogart's work to stand on. I had 
LCFG to build on when I built Puppet. And, you know, Mark had almost no one to, to, to copy. And he's still out there doing important research. I'm just standing around doing worthless stuff. Maybe it's Adam who was right. Right? He had Puppet to stand on, so he had even more work that he could rely on, that he could say, oh, I really like that part, but <laughs> that's really, really bad. I'm not going to do that. And so maybe he was right. Maybe Michael Zahan was right, and we should all be using Turing Complete YAML. I don't know. Clearly, Ansible seems to be winning, so maybe he was right. The fact is that no one cares, right? Like, none of this matters. The differences between all these products it doesn't really matter, right? We've been having entirely unimportant arguments for a very long time. We've been doing it enthusiastically, but we haven't gotten that much done as a result. And because it's not just this group, right? So I, uh, Mark started talking about his work in 1993, right? I joined the Lisa community, the argument at the Lisa community in 2000, and I, I honestly can't remember what things we argued about that. I know ordering was one of the big things. I'm super, super happy that ordering is not one of the big arguments in this community. Thank you so much. Um, we have other stupider things to talk about. Um, and then uh, I got into a long argument in 2005 with a bunch of people, uh, I think none of whom, I don't know if Mark was at that event at the University of Edinburgh, but, but I don't think anybody else who was at that is still in this world. Um, I don't remember what we argued about back then, I just remember how wrong they all were and how I was going to prove them wrong by starting Puppet and doing all these amazing things. And no small part of what convinced me to start Puppet was that, that kernel of you know, insult, anger, and just how bloody wrong they all were that I walked out of that event with. But in the end, I'm not actually convinced that a single technical decision that I made in all the work that I did on Puppet actually mattered that much. And when I say that much, I think I mean it all. I still cared, right? I, it, it still means a lot to me. Somebody made some snide comment about Puppet last night at dinner. Thankfully, it was far enough away from me that I couldn't do anything about it. But uh, it still hurts, right? Like, it still means a lot to me because I still think I was right. But I'm not sure it matters that much. They provided me a really important focal point. They gave me something to focus on. They gave me a purity of purpose, right? Because it's hard to be out there proselytizing, carrying the staff, walking around with the big cross on your shoulders, unless you really deeply believe. And it's hard to believe about things that you think are unimportant. So you have to believe that they're important. I needed that. Look at that. I'm bringing the world to an end. One big benefit of modern lighting. That thing would have blown up if that was 20 years ago. <laughs> would have been pretty sweet, honestly. A nice little punctuation. Might start bringing that into all my talks. <laughs> Looks like it. Yeah. Oh, now Adam's putting the spotlight on himself. That seems kind of selfish. <laughs> That's what I was going to tell you. <laughs> can you all see me well enough that I can keep talking while they're, and, and also focus on, you know, I won't be distracted by the lights? I can't actually see any of you because the light's still in my eyes, so uh, I'll just assume you're all nodding and I'll go on. Uh, so everyone in this room, you all have your own paths, right? You all have these things that you hold tightly to, and for all that I think in general Mark is right, we're all members of tribes. We all have our different roles in those tribes. And that means that there are things in the tribes that we care deeply about. There are arguments that we will happily always get into. And then there are other arguments where we see people having them. We just kind of go, really? That doesn't matter. Right? We all have this thing that allows us to keep focused, that allows us to keep fighting. And, and some, of, some of my favorite things about what we've done in the last 20 years, one of the things that gives me the most hope is when I started Puppet, it stuck. It struck out. Struck. I don't, know, I don't know what I was trying to say there. Um, it struck me. There we go. That. So I was a sysadmin, right? I was doing operations work. But when I looked at the tools I was using, there weren't any tools that were built for me, right? There weren't any tools built by people who were like me. I mean, not that many people are like me, but there weren't any tools built by sysadmins for sysadmins when I started it, and. 
don't get me wrong, I like a lot of the development tools. I think they are really good for a lot of the work that I was doing. But it was weird. It, like, can you imagine an architect who is only using software built for software developers? Or an architect only using software built for engineers instead of architects? It's, it's, it's kind of weird. And one of the sources of hope I have is I look out today and I see company after company being started by sysadmins, building software for other sysadmins. I see sysadmins saying, you know what? I can take this idea, I can turn it into software, and I can put it on the internet, and people can use it. And if enough people use it, I can start a company, and I can go get other people to use the software. And for all that, again, because most software is shit, most of that software is going to be shit, at least the people in the room, the people who are doing the work, are now out there building products, telling the story, and starting companies. And to me, that's a really, really good thing. And it wasn't something that was happening 10 years ago, 15 years ago. But all those different paths, all those different things that we all care deeply about, these different focal points, mean there are more options for everyone in this room than there ever happened before, right? There's not just the standard tribes. You know, one of the products that's mentioned on the, on the schedule and that Chris was talking about different communities, I'll be honest, I didn't know that existed before this event. And I think that's great. Obviously, as a puppet shareholder, I hope they fail miserably. But I think it's really good that there are these new ideas. People who say, God, everyone who came before me is just incredibly wrong about everything. I will show them. I think that's good. But again, I think it's mostly irrelevant. right? I think that the differences between the products that we have aren't really that important. Not that they're not important to us. They're just not important to the wider market. You might argue with me and say, no, 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 no. I mean, I agree that like, the things that you care about are unimportant, but the things that I care about, they're super, super critical. But let's test that for a minute, right? Let's take a single person. Imagine generic sysadmin, probably from a distance, and make that person a puppet user. And imagine all the consequences that come from being a puppet user, and depending on which tribe you're in, that probably has positive or negative consequences. And then imagine that user betrays their friends and switches tribes, right? They change jobs, and the job, instead of using puppet, uses chef, and now they have to become a chef user. And now new realities form, and they no longer think about graphs, and now they think about using PHP across their whole infrastructure that's global variables and stuff. Um, so it's a whole different world. Now imagine that same user but instead of switching to Chef, they switch to an environment that's entirely manually maintained and they can't use any automation. Right? Which of those changes is bigger? Not only that, but the change between Puppet and Chef is so small compared to the change to no automation that when you put them on the same scale, you probably can't even see that there's two separate dots. Right? That's how similar all the products we're talking about are to each other relative to the reality of not using anything at all. I know what you're all thinking, duh, right? We all know this. We all realize how different what we bring is to the market. And we know the market doesn't know the difference between what our different products are, right? How many of you have been asked where they can buy some Puppet Chef? I know I have. And I don't know whether they think that Puppet is the company and Chef is the product or what it is exactly, but they might just think it's one word and maybe it, I don't know, it's complicated. The, so the market actually, in many cases, considers it literally the same thing, still doesn't don't know what it does, they just know Docker's made it irrelevant, right? So you see what I mean when I say these differences, they don't really matter. For all the, not only do we care about them, we are actually, we, we constitutionally, we, we have to care about them but they don't actually matter. Each of us builders, especially, all the people building these products, but also all the people telling the story, all the people who are out there recruiting new users, we had to become enamored with our worldview. Right? We had to not just think about it a lot, we had to fall in love with it. We had to be able to spend, we had to in order to spend so much time on it. And we had to have something that we could hold on to really dearly because it takes a lot to go out and do what we've been doing for the last infinite amount of time. And working as hard as we have over the years, it, it encourages this kind of myopia, this kind of ability to only see what you've decided to care about. All right. It's fine. I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. 
And this kind of narrow, close focus is important. <laughs> it was necessary so that we could build something that our users loved, right? Because this is the real goal. The goal is to build something that, that, that people will use, and when they use it, they will love it. <laughs> I guess that answers the question of whether people will be distracted. <laughs> This is pretty much the definition of good design. Understanding enough about your user's problem and then being able to get the general shape right and then really sweating the details. Getting the individual bits right so that what you have works at a large scale and a small scale. And to get those little bits right, you have to block out everything else. But the definition of focus is that it's narrow, it's limited. That blockage means that you can't see other things. And we in each of our communities, and as individuals, have let the things that we were focused on take up too much of our horizon, take up too much of what we can see, too much of our lives. Holy crap. And the world has changed with what we did, right? We put an unmistakable stamp on the world around us, but I'm not convinced we changed enough with it. And I think now it needs us to change, or honestly, it just needs us to move out of the way. What mattered for me about Puppet was the goal. I wanted to build a product that nearly anyone could use to solve nearly any kind of problem. I wanted to make it so you could stop doing manual work and stop firefighting and spend more time shaping your software. And everyone agreed, right? If you look at what all the other competitive products are trying to do, they're all, we're all trying to do the same thing. We all have pretty much the exact same goal. And the existence of this community is a sign that we have an aligned goal. There is no community without a shared sense of identity, without a shared thing we're trying to accomplish. Even if the mechanism by which we would accomplish them is wildly divergent. And here we are 10 years later, still disagreeing about something that only the people in this room give two shits about. What a waste. I sometimes torture myself with the question of what would happen, what could, have hap what could we have done if we had done it differently? What if what if we hadn't split off? What if, what if we had been able to join forces here or there? To be fair, we did try a couple times. I mean, most people know that I started in the CF Engine community, and actually, prior to CF Engine, I was an ISCOMP user, I guess. I think I was, I was one of two. Um, so that meant I, was, I actually wrote it and used it. I don't, I don't really know how to describe that. Um, but when I decided to start a company, I originally started with the CF Engine code base. Um, I don't think Mark was terribly happy with the thing that I named my fork of it. Um, but I concluded in the end that C wasn't right for me. Um, I'm not sure it's right for any humans. Um, and also that it made sense to have a complete fresh start for psychological, technical, and lots of other reasons. So I started from scratch. Um, and in 2007, roughly, I don't know exactly when it was, I flew out to Seattle to try to you know, figure out whether Puppet, then called Reductive Labs, and HJK Solutions, which is where Adam and his uh, friends were doing a consulting company around Puppet at the time, if we could all work together. But we couldn't come to an agreement on what kind of company we would be, how we would make money, and therefore on who should own what. So it all fell apart. And not too long after that, the infamous Sweaty Balls post launched Chef into the world. Um, eh, sorry. Sorry to get your reference to testicles wrong. Um, I have weird scars around that time for some strange reason. I can't remember all the details. Imagine that timeline, though. Imagine a world where Puppet and CF Engine were one community, or a world where Puppet and Chef were not just a group of people who are a lot like each other but don't like each other for some reason. Imagine that was actually one community and one tool chain, and all of the great ideas in both those communities had been put into one product, 
and all of the salespeople that have been hired by both, by both those companies were competing with the people who aren't using any software, any stuff, instead of competing with each other. Right? Imagine how different that world would be. It's fun to think about, isn't it? It's weird, but it's fun. It probably would have been a huge disaster. But it doesn't matter now, right? We moved on, the lines are drawn, the money's all spent. And the world has moved on with us. The world has moved on. Why haven't we? When we started, I think it's hard to see this now. It's hard to remember back then. And for those of you who weren't around, you don't know, right? You weren't around. But there were a bunch of hard questions we had to answer. There were a bunch of things we just didn't know. And the early days was really about figuring out the answers to those questions. There were a bunch of things that I started Puppet with that I, I you know, they were, they were things that I hoped or believed, but, but I had no idea, right? And you spend a lot of time figuring out whether you can do something, and then if you can do it, can you do it in a way that other people can use, and things like that. And we had a lot of unlikely beliefs, right? There are things that I was absolutely convinced about that I hoped were true. <laughs> and we had all of us, anybody who is building tools, anybody who is building tools today, you have to spend some time going through and proving some things right, and then disproving other things, and you have to figure out, are you willing to let go of the things that are obviously wrong? And that, that early period is incredibly important. And it, it formed who we are as individuals, who are, how our products work, and how our communities work. But it's mostly done. We answered most of those questions. Certainly, the questions that I founded Puppet to answer, the beliefs that I founded Puppet to prove, and I use the word founded, those are all good, right? And I dumped the ones that I, you know, turned out definitely were wrong. So why are we here? Why does this event even still exist if we've already done all that work, if we've already proven all of that? I think that was just the first big win. I think that was the first horizon. And to keep doing work, to do work in the next 10 years at anything like the rate that we've done it in the last 10 years, we all have to reset our goals. We have to rethink what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, and really, really importantly, who we're trying to do it for. Because there's this miserable disconnect between what is possible, what we've all shown is possible, what we've, what we've proven is possible in our own data centers, in our own worlds, and what's actually happening on the ground right now. You know, as Chris said, we don't want to admit it, but man, there is a lot of manual administration still going on, and it is really bad. I mean, it was bad 10 years ago, and things were way simpler 10 years ago. It was bad 20 years ago, and things were way simpler 20 years ago. And these different strategies that we used to get here, that we used to accomplish what we've accomplished, they were incredibly important in the exploration phase. They were critical. And partially why they were critical is because we had to come up with a single coherent worldview. And part of why we were critical is that the arguments themselves were necessary. Right? If you show up and you're like, aha, I believe a thing, and no one ever questions you, then 10 years later you find out, oh, that was a bad idea. Right? The world goes one way. But if you show up and go, ha ha, I believe a thing, and everyone goes, well, here's how you're freaking wrong, then you early on get to get to better answers faster. So the arguments were necessary. They were helpful. They made all of what we did better but now they're just in the way. And not only has the world moved on, right, it's still moving. And I'm not one of those people who thinks it's moving faster than it ever has before. I think the world always moves more quickly. It's just that our ability to move with it slows down, and so we feel like it's moving faster. I think they call that getting older. And I usually think there's no way to get the genie back in the bottle, right? There's no way that all the important, awesome, super cool work we've done over the last 10, 20, 30, 90 years is going to get lost, right? We have forever altered the landscape of how people work. And it might take 10 more years or 30 more years for what we've done to percolate throughout the rest of the system. But at some point, we'll look up and everyone will be using a thing that looks and smells a little bit like the products we build right now. But there are other times where I'm not convinced, <laughs> where I think, there's a hard fork to some other direction, and people convince themselves they actually don't need any of that. Right? 10 seconds after Docker was released, I had an analyst on the phone saying, well, now that Docker has made configuration management entirely irrelevant, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> <laughs> and 
And the crazy thing is, if you push on people a little bit, they really would say to you the equivalent of, well, what we're going to do is we're going to increase by a factor of 10 the number of computers we have, and as a result, it'll be so simple we won't need automation anymore. <laughs> Makes perfect sense, right? But when people believe this kind of idiocy, it's pretty easy for you to say to yourself, eh, maybe they're going to figure out all of our work after all. This is my darkest timeline, right? This is the thing that scares me the most about the future in front of us. The whole world is so enameled, enamored and enameled with new stuff. Container orchestrators packed to the gills with longer, crappier shell scripts. That we find ourselves, we may find ourselves in 10 years exactly like the bad VM sprawl, right? Except that <laughs> like the only thing I can imagine worse than the VM sprawl from a few years ago is that same thing with 100 times as many servers, each of which only exists for five seconds. So when a problem shows up, you can literally never figure out what the problem is. <laughs> yeah. I expect most of us uh, think the work we're doing will become obsolete much faster than that, right? I think the, the rate of change that Mark's talked about, the rate of tool adoption and removal, I think we all probably kind of hope that it, it all goes away faster than, uh, than that. I, I certainly hope we aren't still wrapping shell scripts in 50 years. I still, you know, I, there are many things I like about my Mac, but one of the things that deeply offends me about it is that it, somewhere in that computer, it is lying to itself about having a TTY, like a physical serial cable connected to it, so that my terminal works. And on the one hand, I like that my terminal works, but on the other hand, I just have to ask, like, how long is my computer going to have to lie just to make bash work? It doesn't make any sense to me. So we all know, on the one hand, we've got this truth that we're ready to deliver to the world, and it, it should be ready. But we also know the world doesn't change nearly as quickly as we would like. And usually it changes by layering crap on top of layers of crap. And in general, the world's not actually ready for our truth. This is the challenge I've spent the last few years a puppet trying to figure out. It took me a long time to realize why I was struggling. I was really unhappy, I was really confused. Um, obviously, everyone who was asking me these challenging questions was really, really wrong, but I couldn't figure out exactly how they were wrong. Uh, and then it took me even longer to figure out some kind of answer to this challenge. And, and it was strange, because right when I should have been celebrating, right, when all the people around me were like, oh, congratulations, everything is so great, oh, isn't this awesome? You should be proud. I had this, this sense of, yes, a sense of accomplishment, but also a sense of despair. A sense of, this is really not good. And, and I was correct to have this mixed sense, because we had done a lot, right? We had gotten so far, but, you know, we had won. I haven't used this thing in like four years. I'm surprised it still works. Again, we did everything that we could possibly have imagined. And, and as always, the thing that makes me happiest, at almost every event that I go to, somebody comes up to me and says, the equivalent of, Luke, my life is just a little bit better because of Puppet. I spend more time on things I like. I got a promotion. I stayed in the job that I had because I no longer hated it. And, and that's what it's all about, right? In the end, it's not really about the software. It's not really about the stupid computers that, let's be honest, we all really, really hate. It's about the people. It's about making the work better and making the people happier as a result. But our infighting, our inability to look past these things we're focusing on that we're arguing about, has also caused us to not keep up, caused us in this eddy point where we aren't doing as much as we could do. We aren't getting done as much as we could get done. And it was reasonable that we had those, those disagreements in the beginning. Again, it was healthy, but I think we stayed too myopic, and now the world sees us as damage, and it's just trying to route around us. I started Puppet to leave system administration, and I, I, apparently I managed to convince people that I really, really deeply care about it, and as long as by care about it you mean try to eradicate it mercilessly, then I definitely do. But every shell script, every piece of automation I ever wrote was 
attempting to not have to do my job anymore. You know, Mark said he really enjoyed those early days of figuring out the system. I, every time somebody asked me to do anything ever, my first question was, is there some way I can avoid doing that? And automation was the answer to that question. And this search, this process of trying to understand this combination of accomplishment and disappointment is what led me to leave Puppet, right? It's what led me to try to find something else. I had been trying to leave for 20 years. Can I please just go now? I don't know why Chris invited me back. But I think there is an awesome path from here. I think there is really great, interesting, cool work to do from here. I just think it looks really different from what we've been doing in the last 10 years. And if you, if you look at what Puppet is doing now, if you look at the products they're shipping, if you look at the stories they're telling, and really if you look at any of my talks over the last three to five years, I've been trying to have this conversation with the market. I will stand up and say, hey, here's this thing I believe, or here's this thing you're all wrong about, and then people will shout at me and throw tomatoes at me on stage, and then I'll have arguments with them afterwards. And that conversation has been a long, evolving process, but it's been a huge part of helping me to come to the conclusions that I'm trying to share here. Um, but I think it's also, I know because I was there, it's also helped change the strategy that Puppet's on, right? Puppet has a very different product strategy today than we did five years ago. And you can see this conclusion that I've come to, you can see that showing up in what we're trying to do. And I hope to God that Puppet's able to do it in a way that does help move the whole market again, that does help find a way to move past the petty disagreements and focus on more automation. Because I do think that everyone here is needed. I do think that the whole community is needed. When I left Puppet, or not when I left Puppet, when I started Puppet, there were 10 people, 10 individuals whose names I wrote down in a text document that I wanted to bring with me. That I thought, these are the 10 people who better understand what's going on than anybody else who can have the biggest impact. Right? But if you start a company today and you want to prove the next thing right, there are hundreds of great people. Right? There's way more than 10 who could have a really meaningful impact on some new technology, some new space. To me, that is great progress. But I think it also puts some kind of moral weight on those people. Right? You've got this great knowledge. You literally know more about this problem than hundreds of thousands of other sysadmins. And that gives you an ability to do more for them than you might realize. So the challenge I give to you is, how can you take that great skill, that great knowledge, all that understanding that you've developed over the years in these tribal fights that we've had, and really bring those to the rest of the world? Not in a way that makes your tribe win, but in a way that makes that delta between using anything at all <laughs> and not using something that crosses that delta. <coughs> And I think it's important to understand that at some point we will achieve pervasive automation. I don't know when that will be, but at some point we will. And once again, the methods, the strategies, the things we're going to argue about on the path, when we achieve that, those differences will be just as relevant then as the differences between our products are today. And yes, the way we get there, it sets the frame of reference, right? We can end up in some weird, bizarro universe where, you know, if this tool wins, the world looks one way. If that tool wins, the world looks another way. But in general, the difference between getting there and not getting there is so much bigger than how exactly we get there that that's what matters. Because we do have to finish this work. I don't think we can begin the next round of exploration, the next round of experimentation, the next round of, you know, going back to our roots until Everyone's using it. Once, every, once automation is everywhere, then we can finally begin, you know, imagine a world where you don't have to ask, is it fully automated? Imagine a world where it's all built in the system. We will get there, and that's when the fun starts again. And in the near term, it probably will feel very tactical. It will feel, at some times, more boring. The last decade was all research. The next decade is all implementation. It's all scale. It's all reach. But this is the work that's going to determine our legacy. This is the work that's going to determine if infinite layers of containers packed with shell scripts is what the world looks like going forward, or if there's some sort of tooling on the side, some sort of system that at least tries to make sense of it, tries to have a conversation with the infrastructure. What I need you to do is, every day when you wake up, ask yourself, how can I get us 50% closer 
to pervasive automation, because you're never going to get all the way there, like Zeno's paradox, where he managed to prove movement's impossible. But getting halfway closer, getting halfway to the goal, halfway to the goal, halfway to the goal, every day. Thank you.